Okay, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, if you're with me in Dubai at the moment. Actually, it's good afternoon for you as well, isn't it, Because it's just turned It is, well. yeah, it's afternoon here in Kobe. Yes. So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to ELT Time Mina, which is our coffee, uh, coffee break style advancing learning podcast, where for each episode I'm joined by an, a guest, an educator who is based right here in the Middle East and North Africa region. And together we have a nice little conversation over a topic of their choosing. And um, we have that over a nice cup of tea. This morning, I am drinking, I've got a really unusual flavor. I've got, hang on, it's here on the, on the thing. It's called Asian Pear Harmony. Mm. Very nice. And I'm in, looking forward to it, I've never tried it. Okay, well, I'm having a jasmine tea here, so completely different. Ooh, very nice. I like jasmine tea, yeah. Also very Asian, we're going for an Asian tea theme extremely on the, on the podcast this morning okay so let me introduce to today's guest i am joined today by the one and only the wonderful Reem al chennai and it's a real pleasure to have you here with us this morning thank you for bringing your tea bringing your ideas and giving us your time let me give people a very very quick introduction as to who you are so dr reem is an assistant professor at ktech q8 technical college in uh, q8 She's also head of library as well. And I think you manage the English and general studies department. That's right. Yes. So I am a faculty member in the English um, and general studies department precisely. Perfect. Uh, she's got a PhD in applied linguistics and has recently been voted as the president elect of TESOL Q8. And she was the conference chair for TESOL Q8 prior to that. And if you haven't seen or heard TESOL Q8, uh, look them up on any of the social media platforms. Um, they're doing loads of activities, of which actually I will be joining you very soon. So we'll announce yes. that at the end, I think. Definitely. Delta uh, certified. Uh, she's got 13 years of teaching experience, so extremely well qualified, extremely well experienced. She's taught lots of things, um, literature, uh, ESP, foundation courses, um, mostly higher education, I think, Reem, your background is in. Uh, she's worked at the College of Science, the College of Arts, the College of Women at Q8 University, so several of those colleges, all of which I think I've been to, actually. Q8 International Law School and uh, Q8 College of Science and Technology, where she was head of the languages department, and where I was lucky enough to meet you for the first time. And I said in my LinkedIn post that I'm so super excited to be doing this podcast with you because you were, I think, one of the first people that I met when I moved to, to Dubai, um, oh, it's a long time ago now, and it feels even longer because of COVID, I think. Yes. But yeah, way back, 2015, 2016, something like that. And yeah, my first trip for, for Cambridge at the time was over to Q8, and I remember our one of our first meetings. And I remember leaving, actually, and saying, oh, this job's going to be super nice. Everyone's so friendly, like, when I go out and visit them. Um, and I'm sure that was because of you. You set, set a good tone, I think, for my experience. <laughs> here in Mina. Uh, a couple of other things before we, we move on. Um, Dr. Reem has also been a team leader for exam writing, a unit testing representative, as well as department accreditation officer, working with CEA, which is the Commission on English Language Program Accreditation. And let's just let you know about, know about some of her research interests as well, which include language teaching methods, teacher education, second language acquisition, learning styles, L2 reading and writing research, technology in language learning and curriculum. I, I don't know how you find time. I know you've got a family as well on top of all of them. How do you find time to explore all of these research interests that you have? I'm not sure, but it's a real pleasure to have you with us uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's a true pleasure to be here. Thank you for actually um, getting me to join ELT time. It's a true pleasure and I really can't wait to just dive in and talk about our topic for today. Yes, absolutely. Um, our topic today is going to be competency-based training and I'm not actually going to say too much about it because I know you have loads of things you want to share with us. But before we've started, I mean, I gave people a very, very brief kind of CV type of overview of you, but I think it's nicer if it comes from you. If you tell us a little bit about yourself, just a couple of minutes, like how did you get into education? Um, some of the more kind of personal stuff, perhaps, about. All right. 
well. I actually started really early when I was a student doing my bachelor's degree and um, I TA'd back at Kuwait University and it was an actual job. I was getting paid to TA at the time and um, it was a true pleasure, honestly speaking. And I truly found my passion in just connecting with students and helping them and just um, guiding them through things that they weren't very certain about. And I think that's how it all started. So it started with a quest to to just um, try something new. And it was an amazing start. And I knew from that moment that it's something that I want to pursue and I wanted to really um, find myself in. And um, I just kept learning and experimenting. And I worked with amazing people that did help me grow and basically allowed me to be where I am today. Um, I mean, it is something that, you know, we all get support in and it's, it's, it's not easy at all, to be fully honest, but um, there's not a lot of time and that's why, you know, teamwork is really important because um, you get to work with people that really help you get to what you want to achieve. And so even when it comes to business to TESOL, Kuwait, TESOL, Kuwait is completely volunteer work. And I work with an amazing team that helps me and I end up, you know, setting up all these monthly webinars with different speakers and um, the annual conference. And then when it comes to work, I also have a wonderful team um, who help me and I help and it's just exchanging ideas. And I think that's what's really important today, um, exchanging ideas and just helping each other. It really promotes, um, you know, elevating and being where we most of us are. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess that's why I said this podcast up in the first place was was again just to allow people to to talk and share um their experiences and, and to work together largely you know not feeling like we're by ourselves um that other people out there are doing things experimenting struggling sometimes exactly you're right and and you know what you've just said i think it does echo a lot of the sentiments from a lot of the guests that we've had it's hard work education is is not easy um, teachers are, are super passionate always. Um, and I love hearing about their stories about how they got into education. There, there's usually some element of, you know, somebody inspiring them or, you know, they're, they're real people, pe people persons. I don't know if that's the correct way to say that. I'm sure it's not, but yeah, they're, you know, people like to interact with other people, uh, whether that's colleagues or whether that's students, they've got a real desire and drive to, to empower their students and, and, and know that what they're doing makes a difference, I think, in the world, so. Definitely, I completely agree. And I think that kind of brings us to our topic today and how um, different teaching strategies, there are so many different teaching strategies and then we can just adopt some of them within our teaching, yeah. within our courses, just to aid our students and equip them with the things that they need for the future. So definitely, I think this, um, platform of exchanging ideas and experiences is really crucial because as teachers, the struggle is real. And, um, you know, having students of sometimes different levels, um, uh, different backgrounds, it's a true challenge. So being able to create such an environment where all students are engaged is not easy. And um, being able to share different techniques and experiences with others is something that's truly valuable and important today. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And, I, and I'm and I'm interested, actually, about this topic that we've got today, because actually, I mean, I've probably integrated parts of it, but I've mm -hmm. never uh, really seen it as a as a whole model, because it's actually a, a framework that you're using. It is. So I think pro other people are probably very similar to me. They probably don't know that much about competency based training, actually what it actually is. Um, and, and also, I mean, I said before, you've got a CELTA. I did my CELTA. It's not something that would come up in something like a CELTA. CELTA is very structured. You know, it's kind of you do this, you do this, you do this, and, and away the student goes. So, you know, you're, you are, like you say, delving into, into deeper, wider methodologies um, and pedagogies. So let's start with perhaps the, the basics. What, what is competency-based training? So it's more of an educator-led reform that a lot of schools are actually implementing nowadays. So Kuwait Technical College is a vocational college, so we have to equip our students a little differently. Um, but regardless of being a vocational college or not, 
competency-based learning or education can be implemented within all of our courses and it doesn't necessarily have to be English. So that's what's amazing about it. So the concept, the concept behind competency-based education is really simple. So it's basically um, making sure or allowing your students to demonstrate their mastery of learning rather than the number of hours they have to put in in a specific classroom for a certain course or skill. So it's making sure that they're able or they're equipped enough to be able to uh, demonstrate whatever it is they, they need for um, their life, for their workforce in the future. Um, and this is something that we tend to miss out on quite a lot because we tend to focus on the reading that we have to finish or the grammatical structures that we have to teach by the end of the semester. And then it's just uh, a take a step back and looking at the history of it. And competency-based um, education or learning started way back uh, in the 1900s where um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes were, were most important, most valuable. So you could have someone who was a farmer who was amazing at agricultural skills. And you could have someone that passed their agricultural course, but had no idea about the skills of farming yeah. or what it was basically to, to farm and to make sure that your plants were alive. So what we tend to do in our classrooms is equip our students with the necessary tools and skills that they need in order to survive their workforce or in order to survive what comes after college. Okay. So I hope that kind of sums it up for you. Yeah, yeah, it does. So it's it's not just looking at it as a as an academic endeavor. You learn, you get tested, you prove you have knowledge of it, and then we assume that you can translate that outside of the classroom into um, practical application. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Precisely. So what we're trying to do is make sure that our students are employable after they're done with our classes. So yes, we do equip them with the grammar and the vocabulary words and the terminology and the writing skills that they need. Yeah. But what kind of writing skills do they need after they're done with college? Um, what kind of employability skills will they need after they graduate from our courses? Um, are we taking a step back and really recognizing the important skills that our students need to be employable? Yeah. Um, are we making sure that uh, they're going to survive the real world after they're done with our courses? And this is basically um, a, a new trend, I would say. So remember when critical thinking became the buzzword? So I think we're moving, we're transitioning to make sure that our students are equipped with the right skills that they need in order to survive um, after they're done with college or in order to survive their time within college or um, their, their degrees after they pursue their um, bachelor's and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I've talked a lot about this, I think, over the last couple of years. Uh, we did, at the beginning of this year, I think around February, we did... Um, an event in Saudi Arabia with Stella Cottrell, right? And she was talking about a lot of these things, um, you know, the, the movement from academia to study skills and building up certain types of study skills and how they then feed into life skills, which is what you're talking about, the ability to, to do things. And also the things, I think there's been a big conversation and critical thinking fed into this, I think, about what it is that students need once they leave education. And this worry within economies, within the workforce, within politics, that students are leaving with certificates, they've got you know a whole bunch of A's, but in the workplace, they, they don't have you know, communication skills, uh, empathy skills, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, the ability to work independently, manage their time. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole host of of these things and you can look them up there's like each year there's the top 10 Forbes so list. yeah lo loads of these lists so basically what you guys it sounds like what you guys are doing is you're trying to kind of bridge this gap between okay they've been going through school and they've been learning this and they've been learning that and they've got these skills and they've got some language they need this afterwards it's it's our job really to bridge that gap we can't just prepare them academically and hope that they're going to be okay that that's pretty much what I'm getting, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And um, we kind of basically involve or try to embed some of the activities that we do within our courses or within our units, um, even, you know, going down to, to our units. So, for example, one of the units that I'm currently teaching is uh, entitled Careers. And it talks about, you know, different career choices, whether you want to go into a vocational college or, uh, a, you know, a traditional um, college. And um, it talks about the different types of jobs that um, students can choose after they're done there with their educational path. So um, part of the activities that we can incorporate within this unit, for instance, what I'm currently doing is an interview simulation where we sit down and brainstorm different questions that I think my employer will ask me or the interviewer will ask me. And um, we tend to sit down, brainstorm, think of these scenarios. And then once we have this list, um, we will do the role plays. And uh, we're not only using the vocabulary within this unit, the yeah. grammar structures within this unit, but we're also practicing what it's like to be formal, what it's like to be professional, um, what it's like to have proper ethics when it comes to choosing who um, you want to hire, because it is a double role, you know, at the end of the day, the task itself. And um, so it goes into so many deeper levels for the students, because not only are they looking at it from an interviewee's perspective, but an interviewer's perspective as well. And we look into soft skills as well. Um, did this person make it on time for the interview mm -hmm. in terms of time management, um, in terms of punctuality? Um, were, did they answer the questions in a professional manner? Yeah. Um, and in, you know, we, we also involve CV writing and having them prepare CVs for the interviews and, uh, you know, little uh, flyers with the, the job posts and they have to apply to them. So it takes a great deal of work from us in terms of instructors. Um, but then again, it does kind of prepare our students um, for the real world and they get a grasp of what it's like. And this is something that we tend to face really because once they're done with high school and they come to college, there is never a proper bridge that's built for our students. And I think that's why most of our students tend to go into shock mode. And it's like, oh my, what's happening here? <laughs> you know, I, I have to do things on my own. And um, they tend to go to their advisors constantly. Um, but what we're trying to do here is to start building the bridge for them step by step. Yeah. And getting them acquainted what it is that they're supposed to expect when they enter the workforce, um, including interviews. Um, another example of an exercise that I did was meeting minutes. Mm. So um, uh, what we did was in class, we decided, um, you know, let's create a template that we can use for our meeting minutes. What are the most important things? And you leave it to the students to decide. So they end up, you know, brainstorming the usual things, you know, then the name of attendees, who was absent, location, uh, the title of the meeting um, or the topic uh, or the subject that's going to be discussed. And then we actually simulate uh, these, um, the, these meetings and different, different groups get one person to write the, the meeting minutes and the others go ahead with the meeting itself. And we're, we tend to give them specific topics that they're very aware about. Um, and it just, it flows from there. So taking that step to kind of build that bridge for our students really enhances them and it avoids this shock of, oh my, where am I? What do I do? Um, and that's really important to be able to in integrate and get them to manage the tools that they can somewhat um, build upon. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love both of these activities. Um, I mean, I think the first the first reason why I really like them is that I've always said that there's the real danger as students go through schooling, especially, that at the older you get, the more academic we expect them to, to be in class. Yeah, you, I, I mean, I worked in, in nurseries and kindergartens in the UK when I first started. You know, it's play-based learning. It's these types of things, role play, dress up, playing you know, all of these types of things. And that gets lost kind of a little bit as we go through primary school. And by the time they're secondary, you know, especially when they get to you at, at college, 
you know, it's very much, there are right and wrong answers. You need to do this. You need to know this to be able to move to the next step. And it, it sounds like you're, you're, it's kind of almost kind of coming around full circle now. And we're integrating many of those important early skills that they develop back in when they're, when they're older again, because this is role play. It is, you know, being playful with the language. It's not, you know, you were talking about this interview that they're doing. It's not, there's a right and a wrong for an interview. When you go to an interview, it's not necessarily how many certificates you've had or how good you actually are. It's how you can carry yourself. It's how you can develop an immediate relationship with the person who's sitting in front of you. How do they feel about you? Do they think you're going to fit in well with their team? You know, are you personable? All of these, you know, what's your body language like? So it's it's really nice. I, I love these types of activities and, and it's really nice listening to how this competency-based model helps students to see perhaps the bigger picture, I guess. Definitely. And you're talking about so many skills that are incorporated here, like task skills, contingency skills, like are they able to deal with unanticipated um, reality, realities that they're going to face in their workplace or trans, uh, transferability skills, like are they able to transfer everything that they've learned or incorporated into class into these new situations where um, or new contexts where um, you know they're volunteering or um, they get an actual job. So I do know with my kids, they tend to teach them these different skills when they're really young and it's, you know, be responsible, uh, be uh, respectful, be patient, be a listener. And we tend to, like you said, we tend to forget about them later on when they're in middle school and high school. So this is why even in terms of our rubrics, there's a little section that we've added for professionalism. And it's just there to remind them that you at work will probably get fired if you don't submit an assignment on time, if you don't meet a deadline, yep. or if the um, assignment was plagiarized, for instance, or collusion, or whatever it may be. So that percent of professionalism really gets them to remember the fact that, okay, if I do well with my tasks now, I will be ready. I will be running up and running when it comes to my job later on in the future. Um, but of course, it's not an easy um, process to kind of um, come up with all of these activities and incorporate them within um, the units that we teach. So it does take up a lot of time. It takes up a lot of creativity in order to be able to make sure that the students are engaged, um, to make sure that the students understand why we're doing this because you know you tend to teach your students sometime and I know you used to teach um previously and you know sometimes students would stop and be like how is this going to help me in the future or how is this going to help me in real life yeah exactly yeah it was all, all the time and you, and you do need to stop and and I think that's that's part of the pressures within teaching I think uh you know teaching and education itself does need to ask itself the question are we so enthusiastic to get them through to, to offer to fulfill our own objectives that we forget to tell them what those objectives are and, and ask for their opinion uh, and say exactly. to them is is this how you guys want to do this or can we achieve this a, di a different way Could, can you figure something out and like you say mm -hmm. they're so creative they will they can come up with all sorts of things um, oh yeah and sometimes just showing them the unit you think at the beginning and just saying this is the unit these are the tasks these are the readings and this is what you need to produce at the end. It's supposed to be, I don't know, whatever it is, like you say, a letter or it needs to be an email. Do you guys have any ideas? Well, maybe we could do something more fun, more creative. And they'll be like, oh, let's make a TikTok video and we'll do a presentation about it. And you're like, okay, cool. I've got them, like kind of hooked them in. The motivation exactly. is there. And, like you, and I think this is one of the nice things, again, about your um, the interview is that the task itself uses the language, but it's not necessarily about the language. Because a lot of our tasks are very much like you need to practice this particular grammar point. So you're going to walk around in pairs or you're going to, you know, do this particular activity. And they know that you're just making them do it to practice the language. Whereas exactly. this is very much we're practicing something that is really useful for you, but you're going to need those language, that language to be able to do it. And it's exactly. it changes, I think, in their minds. That, that, exactly. That, that. And Sorry, being you, able you to say no, not at all. But I mean, they're able to integrate both um, the language itself 
and the skill itself that will basically help them um, in the long run. So it's a win-win situation. And referring to what you were saying, it's really nice to just sit there and ask the students. And this is why in some of the courses at KTech, what the instructors have incorporated is sitting down with the students and getting the students and the instructor to brainstorm what it is you should be graded on. What is the rubric for this assignment? So they, they would end up telling you or incorporating all of these skills, making sure you know it's not plagiarized and it's uh, sent on time, making sure you follow the correct format or the layout of the email or uh, using the correct language. So it's formal or informal. And it's just so beautiful because you tend to see um, their authentic self and um, getting to see how they can basically incorporate all of these skills. They're, they're aware of what they're going to be graded on. So um, really nice, exactly. So when yeah. it comes to grading them, no one really questions you as to, why did I get a 10, not a 20? So yeah. they know where their setbacks or fallbacks were. Mm. And it becomes less arbitrary for them because yeah. grading for students, especially very young students, it, it is very arbitrary. I don't think they really understand the difference between an A and a B and a C, not really. I, I mm -hmm. But if they've made up, like you say, their own rubrics and they work together to to adapt them, then they then you can say, look, I mean, this hasn't met this. And it's not just me saying that your peers can look at it as well and also say, no, nah, you know, we don't think it, it, it met that, you know, that benchmark. Yeah. And then they can exactly. think, well, what do I need to do to get over that benchmark? And they can reflect on it. And these are, you know, these are all great skills, learning to learn skills, um, mm -hmm. self-determination skills, all these kind of exactly. feed in. Yeah. Exactly. And it's they're valid as well, because at the end of the day, the students know what they're supposed to be assessed on. And when we tend to create these rubrics, it's fair because their input, they, they, they had input in the creation of the rubrics for specific assignments um, that were used in class. So they are basically being equipped with the skills, with the critical thinking skills as well on, um, you know, what's reliable, what's not, what's fair, what's not, uh, what's considered to be valid assessment, what's considered a non-valid assessment. So um, it really equips them and prepares them um, to be skilled employees in the future. And this is where, as head of library, um, I have also volunteers that are students. So we have student workers working within the library, and all of them have different roles. And basically, they have to use English when they're on the job. And um, we, we test them. So they have a little card where they punch in and punch out to make sure that they're there on time. And, um, you know, you go around and sometimes you pretend like you're a guest and you ask them questions to see how they respond. So um, it's a great way to involve our current students. Um, and also they do tend to help our new students um, with whatever it is that they may need. So uh, it's a win-win situation for both ends, definitely. And you've got this, um, you've got this, it sounds like a little mentorship uh, scheme that's kind of coming in there, which I think is really important, irrespective of just this task throughout education, you know, helping students to help each other and see the value in that. And, you know, then they're developing leadership skills, which again is a really important quality. And again, when we're thinking about, I think in the workplace, we want students to understand that it's not just about being good at your job, like you can learn how to be good at a job. You can learn how to, especially if it's, um, you know, something inputting data or, um, you know, all types of manual jobs. But actually there's loads of other skills you need. Being able to stand up for your values and principles, learning how and when to say no, negotiating in the work for all these are really important skills so that you don't just get used and abused wherever you're working. You have a manager's just like, oh, well, they're good. So I can just keep pounding them with tasks. And then you burn out or you hate your job and all of these types of things that we that we learn in real life uh, as yeah. we go along. But how many mistakes do we make along the way before we realize I can actually exactly. say to my boss, uh -huh. no, but, you know, I don't think that's appropriate. Or I think we could do that a better way without, you know, it, it coming back. And there's all exactly. these types of all these exactly. types of skills.
Okay, before we move on to our next question, I have one kind of follow-up question about, because we've been talking about what was competency-based learning or competency-based training. Do you think you guys use it as a model as it would be, as I would read about it, you know, on the internet or in, in a journal, or does your context mean that you need to adapt it slightly? Or have you, have you made that model your own? Do you kind of integrate it with other methodologies? Um, so we're using it as is. So we're making sure that our students have uh, applied the knowledge in terms of what they've learned in activities that we create for them. So our uh, activities are all in-house activities um, that we create ourselves and we incorporate within the modules or the units that we're teaching. Okay, so yeah, so you're using it very kind of theoretically. And what yes. about, and perhaps a follow-up question to that is um, about, because you, you were saying we a lot, clearly it's mm -hmm. like a, a team effort that's going on. It's not just Reem likes this model, so she's going to implement yeah. it in classes. It's, it's definitely a team thing. So how difficult was it to get people on board? It, it sounds like, a, it does sound like work. And obviously when you say to teachers, we're going to do this and it's going to be more work, they're like, uh, but I like the my PPP and going in and delivering my lecture. And I have my PowerPoints from last year that I can just deliver. How do you get people on board? How do you convince them? How do you, or is everybody just super keen? Well, honestly speaking, um, it allows instructors to be free to kind of be creative in class. Um, and we get to showcase at the end of every semester, it's an opportunity to showcase or, you know, have peers come into class and they're able to see what students have been, you know, generating or creating or learning in the classes. Um, and so um, we are, it, it's not just me, I mean, competency-based learning or education is not necessarily a language only um, uh, medium, but other courses in KTech are incorporating um, competency-based uh, training or learning. So this includes um, IT, this includes math as well. Um, so uh, it's something that we do within all of the courses, more or less, um, in our curricular thinking courses, in our career development uh, courses. So um, I think it's become more of a, an environment that we've built for our students that it's not just you know powerpoints centered and you know just sit down listen and then ask your questions and go home yeah, and study. so it's a really fun environment and i think with such uh models or uh, strategies it's more it's never an individual thing but more of a collective college mission and vision to incorporate such activities uh, or models within the teaching uh, and learning outcomes. And yeah. it's not easy at all, but you tend to see the differences. You tend to see how happy your students are. You tend to see um, how fast they're learning, how faster they're learning. Um, and uh, the outcomes, the outcomes. So we do simulations with different companies as well for our critical thinking courses as well and whatnot and um, career development. And so these, um, let's say minor steps, not only prepare them, but they do a wonderful job where a lot of our students get uh, internships um, within their time at KTech. So um, honestly speaking, with all of the outcomes, uh, I think it becomes something necessary within our courses and classes to be incorporated. Mm. I, 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 perhaps another question then is, is that, is that catching on beyond KTEC, perhaps in Kuwait or perhaps in the region a little bit? Or do you think it's still kind of something you guys are doing? I think I it's explain. more of something that we're currently doing. I'm not really aware of um, other uh, colleges or institutes that are, um, but I do know it's something that we really um, like to do within the college and it's something that is very important to us. Yeah, and it's nice. And it's nice that it, it is creating that bridge. There's internship. I mean, you mentioned the one about the library that's kind of internal, but the fact mm -hmm. that it's connected to external as well and, yeah. and really helps them 
bridge that gap oh, yeah. between oh, yeah. schooling and, and you know working life it, it's really it's really nice I, I like it that. is it is and we do um everything that you would do in your workforce like we would have these weekly meetings um i would listen to their suggestions and implement some of them just to show them that we do listen we do care and that some of their ideas are really important and they're worth taking up yeah which which again is, is such a collaborative approach i think um so this model allows you to be really student-centered. Um, it allows them to be collaborative because it sounds like there's lots of peer assessment, a lot of peer feedback, um, but then also, yeah, collaborative between student and faculty, which again, that barrier is something we, there's lots of, I mean, we talk about collaboration, it's all, usually about getting them to collaborate. Let's get them doing things, get them in groups to do this, get them to do this project. But I think taking that to the next step and having it collaborative between faculty and students, that you take their ideas on board and then feed that back into them, and then they reflect on that, and then they can come back. And it's yeah, very interactive the process. I think is is it is taking that teaching and learning I think to the next level, which is which I think is really nice. Okay, so there's going to be people in the, the room um, or people who are listening later. I'm, I'm sure if they're listening from higher education, they'll get in contact with you because you mentioned that students figure out their own way to not plagiarize. And for anyone that I've ever met in MENA that teaches at higher education level, plagiarism is like the big number one. Like, how do I get them to not plagiarize? So that comment in itself will probably get you some, uh, some LinkedIn ads, I'm sure. But I want you to, to think about this in a wider context. I know you teach at college and most of your experience is there. But this particular model, I mean, we've given it a lot of praise today um, and we've looked at some very practical examples. But what about teachers if they're teaching in primary or secondary? Do you think they could implement this particular type of model? And yeah. based on your own experience, what kind of challenges might they face in trying to implement it? And how would you kind of overcome them? Okay. All right, well, awesome two questions. Um, so to start off with the first one, and I think I, I kind of shed some light on it earlier with my own kids. So um, you can start off with just the basic professionalism or employability um, tasks. So for example, like I mentioned earlier, to being responsible or to being a learner or to being uh, helpful. So this can be incorporated in such tiny ways. So for instance, in my kids' school, as soon as you go in, um, there are five students that are designated to be there at the gate every single day for the five days of the week um, who assist other students, who say good morning, um, who help some students you know, put their school bags in their cubbies. Um, so it's possible. There's, there's no way of not incorporating competency-based training even at you know KG or reception level, mm. because you're teaching kids, um, you know that they have a responsibility. Um, they have to be there on time. Uh, they have to be honest. They have to help each other. So we are kind of equipping them with such skills at such an early age, so that when they do reach college level, they kind of have a grasp of the basics um, of the things that they should already know. Yeah. Um, so it's their responsibility to, for instance, later on um, in college, um, in terms of, you know, choosing what college they want to go to, choosing their fields, um, you know, getting to know whether, uh, what their desire is, uh, what are they good at, um, what field should they get into. So all of that kind of builds up and there are so many activities that can be incorporated within our teaching um, in order to prepare um, our students regardless of age, regardless of what school they're in, what field they're in, there's always space to add it into our curriculum. Mm. Yeah. So, to answer, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You want to finish. I wanted to answer your second question, but go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, I, I mean, I have, I had two points, I think there. Um, the first is, is absolutely, I totally agree that a lot of the skills that they need to fulfill these competencies have sub-skills and pre-skills. Um, and those are important to learn in pre-primary, kindergarten, primary, secondary. So that they, when they get to college and they practice these new ones, they've not got to learn the sub-skills or practice them again. 
they've got that in their minds. And I think the second point is, I, I do think that I'm sure in most schools or in, in lots of schools, many of these sub skills are practiced for some students, but it's, it's in the way you just said that it's sometimes very informally done. You know, if, if a student does show a capacity to take on a leadership role, we encourage them. And then perhaps 29 don't. So we, we just allow that student to do it. I think what's important is probably to structure some of that stuff. Um, and, and I think it's an understanding that leadership can be learned. It's not, it's not necessarily innate within us. So we need to give them opportunities to practice those skills so that they can become better at it rather than just say, oh, you know, Ahmed is, is, you know, he's such a good kid and he loves to help the teacher. So I will just let him. It, it shows something to other students. So um, they, they were my two points that we, lots of it happens, I think, but it's, it's showing them, structuring it, giving them opportunities. And we, we, you can only use the word assessment, but allowing them to see that they've made progress and showing them that we are constantly monitoring that and we want them to do better in it. I don't want to use the word assessment because it sounds very formal, but I know. <laughs> It, it's exactly. informal. It's informal, ongoing, reflective assessment. I think. Yes, you've been very good. Well, how about we let somebody else take care of that today, and um, and then you know try and encourage other students to develop those skills as well. I don't know. That was my comment, anyway. No, absolutely. And there's a lot of space for self-assessment within the process as well. So it's like, um, how do you feel you did today? Did you feel like you did a great job or an awful job? What ways um, can you improve um, uh, whatever assignment you had today um, or whatever task you were responsible for today? And it does also allow a lot of space for self-assessment as well and self-development. Um, and this is something that I think you you joined my um, my my talk for when it was the uh, e-portfolios and providing a platform for self-assessment and whatnot. And this goes back to competency-based training as well. So it's all interconnected if you really think about it. But it yeah. does allow a lot of space for self-assessment. Yeah, that portfolio method is is nice. Yeah. Certainly, certainly through high school. And again, I think what we've just been talking about. Again, it, it happens a lot in pre-primary, you know, that self-reflective, like, you know, with the happy smiley faces or choosing, you know, where you are on the emotional scale and all of these types of things. And again, I think that gets lost. You get to high school and again, we forget to ask them to self-assess. So portfolios, I think are really nice uh, for that. Yeah, definitely. Your, your progress. Sorry, you were going to ask answer the second part of the question. I know we're taking a little to the long I completely forgot the second question by now, so you have to repeat um, it. It was, uh, I need to think what it was. It was, I think challenges was the second one, was it? Challenges, yes. yes. Challenges, oh, so challenges would be time. And I think that's a huge one because you do have a lot of material or topics um, that you do have to cover within the semester. Yeah. Um, so I think time is one of the hugest or biggest challenges that any instructor would face in terms of uh, uh, including competency-based uh, training or education within the course, as well as creativity. So, I mean, with teaching, teachers are burnt out most of the time. So it is something that you have to kind of go an extra mile to do um, and incorporate within your courses and classes. Um, so I think those are the two main challenges so the, yeah. the creativity of the task, as well as the time. Um, however, it all does pay off once you get to see the outcomes of everything um, within the course, with the students, how happy they are, the things that they've learned as well. Yes, yeah, and, and, and based on what you said towards the beginning, it sounds a little bit like to, in order to overcome that time um, and you know creating new materials for them or new activities for them, I think the, the easiest way to try and mitigate some of that challenge is like you said, to involve the student themselves. So exactly. I think one of, the, one of the dangers would be that I need to change everything. And that means I've got to do all the work because that's how we've always you know, acted as teachers. If we're going to change a curriculum, then one of us has to sit down for you know, three weeks and, and create an entire new program from scratch. And nobody likes to do that. I think if, mm -hmm. if the student is incorporated in that process, that will take a bit of that pressure off, I think, right? Definitely, okay. definitely. Getting your students involved, definitely. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, which moves me on to the last part. I don't know if you're going to use this as a tip now. Maybe you will, but we always finish with teaching. That was my tip, but it's okay. Ask the question and I'll answer. <laughs> well, no, we, we finish with his favorite teaching tip uh, on every episode. So uh, why don't you tell us what your favorite teaching... I think we can guess what it's going to be now, but why don't you tell us what your favorite teaching tip is? So definitely allow the students to lead you because at the end of the day, you do want to make sure that they're enjoying the class. So it's always important to find out what entertains our students, what will keep them engaged, what will keep them wanting to um, answer the activities or the assignments and do their best at it. So let the students lead you rather than you always leading the students. And it's such a difficult thing to do, but I think it pays dividends if you can, if you can change that, uh, change your own mindset but then also change your student's mindset. Because I think, you know, I think for a lot of teachers, they are, they're going to feel like my students also aren't ready for this. Um, you know, if I give them this freedom or I, I ask them questions, they're just going to look at me with a blank face and be like, there's an assessment at the end of the year and you're supposed to give me the information um, because that's what they've been used to going through school, perhaps, perhaps not. But, but so, surprise. you they, never I, know. Yeah, I think they will surprise you. Um, so yeah, a great tip, get students involved as much as possible. Reem, we've come to the end. I This tea was absolutely delicious. I didn't see you drink your tea at all. I think you've been so- I did, I did it so many times. <laughs> oh, did you? I, we're both so engrossed in the conversation that it's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't been watching, but this this Asian pear harmony tea was absolutely fantastic. The company is called Stack, if you, if you want to look it oh, up. It's very nice. Thank you, I definitely will. Thank you so much for, for giving us your time, for talking to us about this uh, particular approach. It's it's fascinating. Um, and actually, I can't wait to come to Q8 because I'm going to come to the library and I'm going to see how those students are doing. Yes, um, yes, maybe I'll definitely. Bring, I'll, and I'll bring some rewards for them, perhaps. And uh, That would be amazing. Yes, it'd be really nice. Um, and I can't wait. So hopefully in the new year, I can get to Q8 and, and see you guys. Hopefully, hopefully. For now, though, if uh, for those people who have joined us, uh, either on Facebook or they've been here in the Zoom call, thank you very much for, for listening to us again today. Um, we've got another episode coming up in a couple of weeks, um, which is a Springer Nature author. So obviously, Macmillan is part of Springer Nature, which is obviously a huge academic uh, journal publisher. So I'm quite uh, looking forward to the next guest, because they're going to be talking about a piece of research that they've been done and a book that they've published, which is great. Uh, but for today, though, from Reem and myself, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Reem. Thank you so much once again, um, and best of thank luck you. to you and, and good luck to your students. Um, I look you. forward to not just seeing them in the library, but seeing them, I guess, all over Q8, wherever I'm driving and, and interacting. Yeah, it'd be great. Have a great day, though, to you, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you again in the future, everybody. Thanks, Reem. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah.